So let's pray, and then we'll talk about the sermon. Almighty and eternal God, Lord, our Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light unto our path. And so we pray you that you would open and enlighten our minds that we might comprehend your word clearly, purely, and faithfully. And so comprehending it, may we conform our lives according to it, that we may never bring your most high majesty to anger. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our dear Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit are one true God, and you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. All right, anything that you wanted to share? I don't know if I can answer any questions because I didn't preach it, but anything you wanted to share or, or talk about with Pastor Leskowski's sermon on Holy Trinity? He did. I, th I thought it was the best sermon I've heard her preach, actually. I'd, uh, I can say uh, some of my thoughts. Now, you understand I'm always in a perilous situation because I am a preacher. So uh, I have to discipline my mind because there's two things that I want to happen. I want to hear God's word, but then my other thing is, as a preacher, how does he get, how is he going to do it? And uh, one of the things I liked about what Kurt did was he, uh, his method is what we call expository. So he was very detail-oriented. He went verse by verse through the text, and he preached on the Old Testament text. Um, and I don't typically do that, but I like to hear when other people do. Um, that's not always how my mind works. Uh, my mind is always in a state of kind of schizophrenia, I guess. But um, thank you. <laughs> I can't get out of it, so that's just how it is, you know. Well, thanks, thanks. But um, and I think we get in the Lutheran church typically we get a lot more exposition in a Bible study as opposed to a sermon. But there are churches where, um, and, and in fact, it's it's how Luther preached, uh, and Luther really just got up and kind of talked. And he went verse by verse, and when Luther was done, he says, that's enough for today, amen. And that was, I mean, he preached on the lectionary. But um, I appreciated that. And the thing that I liked about his sermon was he preached, he preached what I would call a very, like, liturgical sermon because he talked about, he, he made an observation I'd never noticed before. So the text was Isaiah 6 which pairs nicely with Trinity Sunday because Isaiah in the temple, he sees the vision of the Lord and uh, God refers to himself in that plural that we see sometimes in the Bible. So the text of Isaiah doesn't explicitly say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but God does say who will go for us, right? Plural, the Trinity, who will go for us and the cherubim or the seraphim, whichever, that are encircling the throne, they're calling out holy, 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 the way that we do in the liturgy. It's a threefold holy. So it fits nicely with Trinity Sunday. But uh, what I mean by he preached it in a liturgical way was he talked about how God does not speak to Isaiah before Isaiah's sins are atoned for. So it's the, it's the voice of the angels that's shaking everything. You know, the foundations of the, the, the temple were shaking. But... Isaiah realizes that he's coming into the presence of God and he's a sinner, and so he makes his confession, and he mentioned that in the sermon. He, he, Isaiah confesses his sins the way that we do, and he says, woe is me, I'm lost, I'm a man of unclean lips, and so God has to provide atonement for Isaiah before he speaks to him, and the uh, seraphim takes the burning coal from the altar and presses it to Isaiah's lips. He says, this has touched your lips, your sin is taken away, your guilt is atoned for. And then when we got that out of the way, now Isaiah is not going to die in the presence of God. And so then God says, who shall, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Um, and he, Kurt, very beautifully tied in. He said that um, Isaiah's atonement comes from the altar and the way that our atonement comes from the altar. Because we receive Jesus, who is our atoning sacrifice. Now, he's, he's sacrificed once and for all, you know, on his cross. But we receive his body and blood sacrificed for us, and we receive all the benefits of his atonement. And that's what takes away our sins, so that we can 
enter into the presence of God and we can hear what he would say to us. So I thought it was really, it was really very good. So that was my thought on it. I thought it did good. And you're like, well, I got something different out of it. But that's what I got out of it. I thought it was good. So, all right, anybody else? Okay. In that case, all right, so last time we finished John chapter 6. And I did promise or threaten that we'd talk about uh, some of the ways that John 6 has been understood and I think it is worth thinking about. You don't have to come down on, have your own opinion about it. Just ruminate about it. Look at my picture while you do it. That will help you find the answers that you're looking for, I guess. But um, because John 6 was what's called the bread of life discourse, Jesus talks about how he is the bread of life. He's the bread that came down from heaven. And then he takes that a step further. He says, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, I'll raise him up on the last day. And then he loses, remember, a big portion of his disciples because that's a bridge too far for them. But Peter and the, the other apostles stay because they say, you have the words of eternal life. So uh, to our ear, what we stopped with last time, I mentioned that to our ear, this does sound very... Um, Eucharistic. It sounds a lot like the Lord's Supper. So I want to talk with you a little bit, and I think this actually helps. The thing that this helps with is as we go through the Gospel of John, I think thinking through this issue helps to make us better readers of John. Because in the first, not even counting chapter 6, just looking at the first five chapters, one of the things that we've seen about John is that John is a deeply spiritual, subtle, symbolic, deep kind of book. And uh, so John 6 is not going to be any different, I don't think, from that. So we won't belabor this, I don't think, too long, unless you're really interested. But uh, I also mentioned last time when we ended that while it's easy for us to read John 6 and hear, at least hear, echoes of the Lord's Supper, when, he talk, when Jesus talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, um, historically, Lutherans, um, Martin Luther, definitely did not like, or, or wasn't, I should say, wasn't convinced that that was the way to read the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6. So I want to talk through a couple of reasons why that is. Uh, probably the, the simplest thing that you could say is that if you're thinking about the overall story of the gospel, if the question is, because remember, that's what they ask you if you go to seminary, and you're a, you're a first-year seminarian, and you exist in that sophomoric state. You know what a sophomore is? You know what the word means? Wise fool. So that's why when you do get to be a sophomore, you know, in high school or college, you know enough, you know, you're not as, yeah, enough to be dangerous. You're not really that smart, but you think you've got confidence, which is good. So like all seminarians, just like all preachers, you know, it's one of the perils of studying theology is you live in a perpetual sophomoric state. Um, but, you know, that's always a question. You're there long enough. Somebody eventually, you're sitting there in the commons eating some popcorn or something, and somebody's going to be like, hey, man, do you think that John chapter 6 is Eucharistic? And you, you better be prepared to answer because there's going to be some fight about it, um, which is fine. It's all great fun, I think. Um, so anyway, but one of the points is, if you think about John, uh, Jesus gives the words of John chapter 6 in the synagogue at Capernaum. We are not to Holy Week. We're not to Maundy Thursday because that's where Jesus instituted the sacrament. And that's actually a pretty, that's a pretty decent point, okay? He has not given the Lord's Supper yet, so why would he be talking about the Lord's Supper? And the other thing that goes along with that is what Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. That's, that's fine and well and good, and there's a way to understand what Jesus is talking about. But he doesn't say, 
He doesn't take a piece of bread and say, this is my body. He doesn't take a cup of wine and say, this is my blood. He doesn't mention wine at all in John chapter 6. So you're missing one element of the Lord's Supper. He's simply saying, the argument goes, that he, he, is, he is the thing that will satisfy you, that will give you eternal life, and that will nourish you. And it will do it in a way that's more lasting and better than that, act, that manna you know, that God rained down for the children of Israel way back in the days of the Exodus. And it's, he is definitely better and more satisfying and so on and so forth than even the bread that he's just passed out. Because remember, the, the setup for the bread of life discourse was the miracle with the loaves and the fishes, the feeding of the 5,000. So that, that is a fair point. Um, the other thing, and I, I guess part of the Lutheran concern with this is when it comes to establishing our doctrine, the, the thing you never want to do is you don't want to establish a teaching of the Bible from something that is less than clear. Now, I think what Jesus says in John 6 is, is clear enough, um, but uh, how, how would you know what the Lord's Supper is? You would have to go and you would read about the institution of the Lord's Supper, which, remember, is given to us by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and... St. Paul, yeah, okay, come on, yeah. Remember, we, Luther, pulled that o- Luther pulled that over on us uh, when we looked at the, the catechism, right? The, so the words of institution, that's the only way to know what the sacrament of the altar actually is, is our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, this is my body, took the cup, this is my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, eat and drink. Other than that, and you, maybe this is not the most helpful exercise, but if you think of it in terms of, if you didn't have that, if you just had John, would we know anything about the Lord's Supper? So he doesn't have it in his diary. He does not, no, yeah. Yeah, John does not have, he does not have the story of the institution of the Lord's Supper, and so he doesn't have the words of institution. Um, he has things that go on in the upper room, and actually, that's a fairly lengthy part of John's gospel, because that's, that's roughly, that's John 13 through 17. That's all the things that Jesus has to, you know, to teach his disciples right before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's arrested, and then we have the passion story. So, yeah, he doesn't, in that form, he does not have it. It's almost like he, Jesus is setting up the the deeper purpose of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Like he's setting that in place so that when it happens, they will come to a deeper, the true reason and purpose Mm -hmm. of it better or more profoundly. I don't know, maybe. I'm not sure if that's how I want to explain it. Yeah, and that that I think, so they're basically in in this discussion, I guess there are two extremes. And uh, you'll find, you can find people of like goodwill and good faith on both of them. So the one extreme is what he's saying is precisely about the Lord's Supper. The other extreme is it has nothing to do with it. And I think the truth might be, sometimes it's all right to have a little moderation. And I think the truth might be somewhere in between. I don't know personally how you could look at it and say it's in no way evocative. It doesn't in any way look toward I don't know how you could say that. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, and so on and so forth. Um, And so I think that's true. I think that reading John 6, see, you have to hold John 6 in proper perspective. So it's it's not the institution of the Lord's Supper. But having known as a Christian what the Lord's Supper is, it certainly does seem to illuminate it, doesn't it? Um, I have a friend who, the way that he prepares for communion every Sunday is before he goes to church, he reads John 6 because it tells him a lot about being on the other side of it. Now that Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper and he's come, well, then you can read it, and there are a lot of wonderful promises that are attached to receiving Jesus in the sacrament. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood and abides in me and I in him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. 
So I, my own view is it's somewhere, somewhere in between those two things. John, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, follow up with that. Because he, he said, and I just okay. have an odd question. Okay, odd question. She's going to hold her odd question. Yes. I, I, that's a good point. Kind of like a classic teaching. Yeah. 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 Jesus you know, used a teaching know, method. You can say, I'm going to go to Hawaii. Well, you know, just often just go. You know, you think, well, how am I going to get there? You know, As the spirit moves you. Yeah. 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 Well, and we've seen, too, uh, the whole Bible is typological like this. That there's always, always, events, persons, and even some of, like, the the rituals and the things that God gives his people, that they always find a fulfillment in Christ when he comes. So Jesus does the same thing. Um, and that, I remember it, it's been said before that when you think about the sacraments, so if, if you, the Lord's Supper and baptism too, Jesus doesn't just invent these things. And what's meant by that is Jesus actually follows a particular pattern that you can see all throughout the Bible. So baptism, I think, is slightly easier. But uh, it goes something like this. And you, you, have to be, you have to be a careful reader of the Bible to see it. But uh, in the beginning, God creates everything. The earth is covered in water. Yeah, it's dark and it's watery. It's watery chaos. And the spirit is hovering over the water, and God is always bringing life out of the water. He does that there, you know, in the creation story, where you get the division between the waters. He brings out the land. He populates the land with all the living creatures. And then you can go, you go forward in the story. Uh, Israel is being chased by Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to bring him back into bondage in Egypt. The deliverance comes through the water. God parts the Red Sea, they go through, the wicked are drowned, the way that your old Adam is drowned in baptism, and Israel goes through on dry ground to the promised land. There are all of these purification rituals in the Old Testament with water, right? They called them baptisms, actually. Uh, and you, you see that even in the New Testament. I mean, Paul talks about how the children of Israel were baptized in Moses because they're delivered through the water. So then you've got the baptism of John the Baptist, where the forgiveness of sins, and then finally at the end of the gospel, Jesus gives us Christian baptism in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, it's the same as with this. Does, does, can, I, can I take from the crossing of the Red Sea what I, everything I need to know about Christian baptism? One cannot. You can't do that. But you can go to where... The, to the words of institution for baptism, where Jesus says in Matthew 28, go therefore make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the words of institution for baptism. But by the time that we get to that, if, if you follow the biblical narrative, you have been prepared for when Jesus is like, and then you're baptized, and that's how your sins are washed away. And you're like, well, of course, that's how it works, because look how God uses water throughout his entire story of salvation. And the Lord's Supper is also like that. The manna is part of that. You know, that's, their, that's what nourishes them in the wilderness. What nourishes us in the wilderness of this world is the body and blood of Jesus. And given that the fact the guy is God, it's not like Jesus doesn't know things ahead of time. Um, I think that's a, that's a, that is a very good point. Like this is what Jesus is always doing. So. Exactly. And, and like I said, there's a lot to be said for the fact that you and I encounter this story having had the whole thing, having had time to reflect on it and by the grace of the Spirit kind of put it all together.
And John, I don't think John wrote it with the idea that, I mean, it's possible, but given that they were, they were written to be heard in the church, he knows what his readers are thinking, you know, what, how they're hearing that. What was your odd question? Well, just when we were reading this, um, he never says here that the wine of the sacrament in his, is his blood. It made me think of the, the Catholics and how they only take the bread, right? Mm -hmm. And the priests drink the wine. And I don't think it's a connection there between this and that, but it did make me think of that connection. There, there, there is a connection, <laughs> in fact. So this was part of... Part of Luther's reticence to read John 6 in a, in a Eucharistic way was Luther had seen how John 6 can be twisted in a way that detracts from the truth about the Lord's Supper. So you're right. So if you read John 6, and you have to think about it in these terms. Now, for Roman Catholics, today, now it depends on the parish. So... Uh, I think, pro, I don't know, I couldn't say. I would imagine most parishes, um, the laity may, if the priest permits it, drink from the cup. But it's never, since, since the Middle Ages, it's never been strictly necessary. So if you read John 6 in a narrowly Eucharistic way, you could say, well, look, all he says is my flesh is the bread that's given for the life of the world. That's all that I need. I don't need, if the priest says no, then I don't, I shouldn't drink from the cup that is so Luther he wants to counter that and so he does say a couple of things and I think Luther is being very um, he's being a little a little narrow and a little literalistic but some of the things that he says and I haven't put this on the sheet for you but part of what he argues is he says well um, it says whoever eats my flesh and drink or if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood you'll have no life in you so he says, does that then therefore mean that we ought to commune infants who have not been examined to receive the sacrament? So it says if you don't, you don't have eternal life. So his concern is, see, that would be reading John 6 in a Eucharistic way that is not helpful because that would make it to seem that, that communion would be absolutely necessary for salvation, which it is not in that absolute sense. Right. Baptism is a sacrament of regeneration. So he has a couple of arguments like that. And because he's seen how it's been twisted. The other thing is, I've mentioned this before. Uh, I think it was the year, it was 1528 or 29. So the, the Reformation is underway. And now there have been other Reformation movements in Northern Europe what's called the Lutheran Reformation, you know, Luther and Melanchthon and some of the others are at the head of that in what we call Germany today, parts of Germany. And the, the Reformed movement has begun in Switzerland. And the head of the Reformed movement is a man named Ulrich Zwingli, who like Luther is a former Roman Catholic priest. Zwingli comes from a very different place intellectually. And Zwingli is a lot quicker to throw out traditional things and anything that smacks of Roman Catholicism, Zwingli wants to get rid of. He doesn't like images, he doesn't like vestments, doesn't really like sacraments, it doesn't seem, because part of Zwingli's thing is he is the first person to really say, I think that the Lord's Supper is symbolic. I think it's a memorial. I don't think Jesus really can give us his body and blood in the sacrament. So. One of the rulers at the time, uh, Philip of Hesse, he wants to have a political alliance for the day that they have to militarily counter their Roman Catholic opponents. So he gets Luther and Zwingli and the other leading lights of the Reformation movements to sit down at uh, Marburg Castle and they have what's called a colloquy, a little discussion, because he wants them to come to a consensus. They can be united doctrinally and theologically, then they can be united politically, and they can be united militarily. That's Philip of Hesse's dream. Zwingli is a very cultivated thinker, a very rationalist, and they more or less agree on pretty much everything, like kind of big picture, and then they get to the Lord's Supper. 
and this is where Luther digs in his heels. And uh, you've got Luther and Philip Melanchthon on one side, and you've got Zwingli and his friend, John Echolampadius, which is a great name, on the other. And one of the things that Zwingli does is he tries to lecture Luther on metaphor and grammar and all of this stuff. But Zwingli is the one, not Luther, who wants to use John chapter 6 to say, look, it can't really be, it's not really Jesus' body and blood. Because you look at some of the things that Jesus says in John 6. We looked last time, toward the end of the discourse, Jesus says, uh, the flesh profits nothing. Remember that? Now, um, we talked about how Jesus' flesh profits a lot, but Zwingli was using that. He used it to say, well, if the flesh profits nothing, how could you eat Jesus' flesh? And then Jesus says these words are spirit. So Zwingli takes that to mean, well, look, if the words are spirit, then that means that it's not, it's not his actual body and blood. So that's one of the reasons, now I think, that's, I think that's a misinterpretation of John 6, but that's one of the reasons that Luther, he would just as soon be like, let's dispense with that. We're not going to argue on the basis of John 6. If you want to argue about the Lord's Supper, you have to look at when Jesus instituted it. And what he said is very clear. He said, this is my body. And he said, we don't have any other argument other than that. I don't have to engage John 6. I don't have to listen to anything else about how you rationalize it. This is the words of Jesus. And you can't get over it. The word is is right there. That's the end of the matter. And Zwingli or uh, Luther refuses to argue on any other terms. He says the only way that you know what the sacrament is, just like the only way you know what baptism is, is you have to take the clear, plain, literal word of what Jesus said. So you can't go to the crossing of the Red Sea. That can support what you can establish about baptism. But you, so you can't go to John 6 to say what the Lord's Supper actually is. So they never come to an agreement. Uh, Zwingli, like, he makes, Luther makes Zwingli cry. <laughs> Luther thinks he's mentally ill. He thinks he's nuts. And he says at the end of it, they have the transcript because there are people writing it down. Uh, the, the transcript of the Marburg Colloquy uh, Zwingli or Echolampadius want, Zwingli's crying, and they're like, we, we want to leave reconciled. We want to leave as brothers. And Luther says, I commend you to the judgment of God. Why don't you go to God and for mercy? <laughs> we'll pray that you'll be enlightened. And I'm like, that's right. So thank God we never united with uh, the Reformed, and hopefully never will. Unless they repent. So anyway, but that's, that's part of Luther's concern, and I think his his concern is valid and well-founded that uh, there's not a problem with John 6, but you might be getting off on a rabbit trail if that's somehow detracting you from what, what is the plain thing that Jesus says? Where did he give the sacrament? Not in John 6. So that should, maybe that should tell us something about the way that we understand it. Is there anything you want to say or ask about that? Luther also makes this point, and I think this is a fair point. Um, I kind of summarize some of it at the bottom of page one and on to the next page. Uh, some of the things that Jesus says in John 6 about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, um, how would I say it? Well, let's, let's look at a few of them. Since this is a Bible study, maybe we'll look at the Bible. Um, if you want to turn to John 6, And I picked out a few. We, we can kind of skip around, but if toward the end of the chapter, 651, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. If you keep going a little bit to 53, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, so what they say that chapter six tells them that they don't need to drink the wine that they feed on, then how can they say that 
I know. Well, yeah, it does. You're right. Yeah, it does say they drink his blood. That's true. Well, and that was why Rome was full of it when they took the cup away from the people. They, they had all these, ra like Zwingli, just on the other side, they had all these rationalizations why they did that. The truth was they did not want to watch people spill Jesus' blood. So one of the ways to prevent spillage is to not let people drink it. I think that was at the heart of what they were doing, but what they said uh, and how they got away with this for so long was, again, they ignored the simple words of Jesus, take and drink. And they said, yes, the priests. The priests might take and drink. But the way that they ignored the words of Jesus was they invented a doctrine that they call concomitance. And concomitance is, this is how it goes. And this sounds, I mean, it sounds reasonable enough, but, uh, and it might have been St. Thomas Aquinas, I can't remember. But basically, all right, so you eat Jesus' body in the sacrament. Jesus is alive, right? You're not eating his dead body, it's his glorified body, okay? What does his body have in it? Blood. Blood. So you're receiving Jesus' blood if you eat his body. So therefore, don't worry yourself with the cup. You see the, the logic. Now that's... I understand that, but that's contrary to what Jesus said. He, Jesus did not say there is, he didn't say there's no blood in his body. He said, eat my body and drink my blood, you know. And that was, that was Luther's thing, whether he was arguing against Zwingli, who wanted a symbolic understanding of the Lord's Supper, or if he argued against the Roman Catholic Church with all of the kind of accretions that they had built up, he was like, it is as simple as the words of institution. We believe what Jesus says there, and we follow it the way that he said it. And that's the end of the argument. And if somebody spills it, then we reverently mop it up and remember and realize that there are many times Jesus' blood has been spilled in ways that it ought not to have been. Like when he died on the cross and his blood leaked down from the cross onto the ground into the sewer. And that was still for our salvation. And so we're not going to not drink Jesus' blood because you can have a spill. I really prided myself. I, I never, oh, go ahead, go ahead. With the squirting of the wine, you know, how we take the wine out of a tablecloth or a paramount with that spray we have. And when I do that, I often wonder about that. You know, most likely it's consecrated wine. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should rinse that out first or try to, I, I, I don't know. It just does go through my mind, yeah. even if it's just a drop or a, a tiny little you know, anything. I mean, I always wonder when I squirt that on there. <laughs> and that's how our practices have developed, because Jesus doesn't give any clear words about those things, but our tradition. So the reason, you know, if you ever poke your head in our sacristy, altar guild room, as it's called, you'll see that they, they separate what's, what has been consecrated from what's not. That's true for both the bread and the wine. That's not making any claim about what is it in the moment. I don't, I don't know. We're not taking eating and drinking in church, so I don't know. But it has been used for that sacred purpose. And uh, I know in my home church, our ladies, when they would wash the stuff, they always washed it separate, you know. They never put anybody's socks or underwear or whatever, you know, <laughs> together with, which is good, I would hope. I, I think that goes without saying, I don't know. But that's what they did, you know. That's why, you know, if we're not going to totally consume everything, then we reverently dispose of it into the earth just like we do the baptismal water and stuff. So, yeah, it's, and so that's always the question. It's like, so there's not a command from God, but what is the best practice, and what's, what's the rationale that leads you down that way? Because um, it reflects something about what you believe about it. Right. You know, if, and you'll notice, if it ever happens, it's not the end of the world, it's not a big deal. If somebody drops a host, what I do usually is I swoop down, grab, I say, my bad, and I eat it. Because Jesus said, eat it. We're not going to throw it away. I'm not going to step on it. He said, eat, take it, eat it. We don't have to worry. Did we drop, you know, is Jesus' body being stepped on? Don't worry about it. I ate it. <laughs> don't think about it. It's all taken care of. So, but yeah, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, so I used to pride myself. I'd never had a spill all through seminary and everything. And I got to Vicarage, and Easter Sunday, the guy had this... Really nice polo, <laughs> and uh, obviously his Easter polo, and I had the cup that day, and just as a public service announcement, um, always give me one hand, or, or take the, whatever you do, 
Give me something. Yes, yeah. Mary Lou does too. John does too, actually. John does too, too. Um, just give me a little something, because I'm confident, but I just want to make sure that I'm doing right, because I'm going to tip it until you drink it. Um, well, he didn't give me anything, and he was a new, he's a new Lutheran. He hadn't been communing very long, so I kept going, and I mean, it's whoosh, right down. <laughs> okay, well, happy Easter. So, it happens, whatever. I shattered a crew at here one Sunday. It was fun. Um, we're not going to stop receiving the sacrament because accidents happen, you know. We just clean them up, put it in God's hands. He's, he's not going to damn us because we accidentally, you know, did something. But it's worth thinking about how do we reverently handle Jesus' body and blood or the elements that have been used for that purpose. So. I have one more question. Yes, go ahead. Go show. ahead. Okay. How many religions or, or believe in the, the way the Bible and Jesus says we're supposed to receive communion. The, the bodily presence of Jesus? Yes. Um, well, statistics, like numbers-wise, the vast majority of Christians. Oh, okay. Because okay. the largest, um, largest Christian body still in the world is the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we can only talk about, I can't say what's in people's hearts, but official doctrine, the Roman Catholic Church believes that you really eat Jesus' body and drink his blood. Okay. So does the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, so does the Lutheran Church, and everybody else varies from maybe to absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So like the Anglicans or the Episcopal Church, uh, if you ever want to know what an Episcopalian believes, you might as well try to like nail jello to a wall, mm -hmm. okay? Because that will tell you with certainty what they believe. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very high church, and they say yes, and some are very reformed, and they're like, it's a spiritual presence type uh -huh. of thing. So, but the vast majority, because that was not something that was never disputed or controverted until Zwingli in the 16th century. All Christians agreed, because it's as simple as what Jesus said. In our given experience, how many Christians do we know that actually believe it? That's another <laughs> question, right? That's another matter. Where I grew up, not that many, okay? But, um, yeah, so yeah, so that the majority, and they're following the majority of all Christians, just simply taking Jesus at his word. Yes, but that's a good question. All right. Okay, so my point here is that sometimes when Jesus talks about in John 6, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he says whoever does that has eternal life. Now, again... Luther, being a very careful thinker, he says, now hold on. If we're thinking about the Lord's Supper, is it true that everybody who eats his flesh and drinks his blood has eternal life? Yeah, the answer is no, it's not true. Because uh, you may... And again, this is one of our big reasons everybody thinks. Also, the majority of Christians in history have believed in close communion. That is the official position of the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Lutheran Church. Except if they're not really Lutheran anymore, like the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Um, who's that? The Roman Catholic Church? If we're in fellowship, they may. Yeah. But, yeah, so, so there's... Part of it is, do we agree on our doctrine? But before we talk about other doctrine, your first concern is, do you believe what Jesus says in the sacrament? Now, because you may eat Jesus' body and drink his blood in your mouth without receiving the benefit, okay? So this is why we don't practice open communion, because Jesus' body and blood are powerful, and St. Paul, when he talks about the words of institution in 1 Corinthians 11, that's why he talks about examination. That's why he says, if you receive the sacrament unworthily, you're guilty of Jesus' body and blood. And he says, you know, in the Corinthian church, because things are not as they should be, either in their doctrine or in their life, this is why some of you have gotten sick and died when you received the sacrament, because you've received it wrongly. So that means... That, uh, yeah, objectively, everybody who communes, irrespective of their faith, receives Jesus' body and blood. 
if they are without faith, if they reject the words of Jesus or they're living in a manifestly sinful way, then they're receiving Jesus' body and blood, but it, it is not to their benefit and potentially could be to their harm. Okay, so knowing that, and that's something that's clearly established in the scripture, then you look at John 6. So is, can, can we take what Jesus says in an unqualified or absolute sense when he says, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life? No. So Luther's like, and that's why it doesn't refer to the Lord's Supper, because that's talking about something different, is basically how Luther argues. So the case is really rather, I mean, I don't know if it's compelling, but I think they make a strong case against it. Yeah, Trish. If this was like the Lord's Supper, it would be like baptism. You don't even have to do it once. You know, you'd be saved rather than doing it. Oh, you mean if like, like if uh, if the Lord's Supper like made you a Christian? Yes. Like if, yes, exactly. Yeah, because they're two different things. Right. And that's part of Luther's thing too, as I mentioned, like with the infants. He's like, well, we don't. Some churches do. Lutheran church doesn't commune infants uh, because communion is not necessary in the way that baptism is, right? This is why, and we've talked about a person may be saved without baptism, but based on what Jesus says, you, you want to get your children baptized. And then when everybody gets their children baptized, even though they believe in a gracious God, when they're baptized, they go, wow, this is good. Because baptism gives you new birth. Communion does not give you new birth. And if you read this passage like that, yes. you're going to have eternal life. That makes it sound like something that we know is not actually true about the Lord's Supper. And that's part of Luther's point. And that doesn't demean the Lord's Supper. I mean, the Lord's Supper strengthens us in our eternal life, but it's not baptism. So that's part of his argument. His whole thing is like, that's not strictly true if you're talking about the Eucharist. Whoever eats is going to live forever. That's not true. Otherwise, we would, we would let everybody, you know, we'd let the birds eat it for, you know, whatever. Whoever eats it has eternal life. So, but that's part of his thing. So that, that's a pretty reasonable, you know, I think, I think it's pretty reasonable. Does anybody else have any? Okay. Let's flip the page. I grouped some of these together because I think this will help you see kind of like the parallelism. Now, just because, I should say this up front, and, and the, the driving point that Luther makes, like when he is at the Marburg Colloquy, is whatever John 6 is about, that in no way detracts from or overturns or contradicts what we know the Lord's Supper is according to Jesus. So there's no dispute about that. So having said that, we can say it is true that Jesus uh, sometimes speaks in ways that are metaphorical or analogical. He tells parables. He tells stories. He uses illustrations. He does that. You know, just because the words of the Lord's Supper are literal doesn't mean that Jesus never uses these other conventions of language or grammar or anything. Okay, we know that. So... What you see in the Gospel of John is Jesus will do this all the time, that he uses different images, you know, to teach about himself and what he's come to do. So you can compare what he says about, in John 6, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. You can compare that to other things that he says, but the, the commonality between them all is he's talking about having faith in him. So let me demonstrate that to you. So those, there are those three passages that are grouped together with, with no spaces. So the first one is John 6, 40. Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Okay, so he's making a, a fairly simple statement about faith. Whoever believes in him has eternal life, I'll raise him up on the last day. Which sounds exactly like John three sixteen. Whoever believes in him will not perish, have eternal life. There is, there is a, um, there's a figure of speech here, though. I didn't underline it. But whoever looks on the sun, okay. So you and I have not, literally, physically, we have not looked on Jesus. Although, as I mentioned in the sermon in Easter, 
my children corrected me, and they said, we look, we look at Jesus all the time, you know? It's hanging on that cross right there. That's, and that was good enough for them. You know, that's the faith of a child. But you and I, we have not physically seen the man. But that's what he's, whoever looks on the Son and believes in him, he's talking about looking with the eyes of faith. That's an image, okay? That's a figure of speech. So compare that then to John 6, 54, which is immediately below. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the argument goes, Jesus supplies different images or figures of speech to talk about what faith is. And we've actually seen this in the Gospel of John before. Now remember um, the woman at the well. We, we met her in chapter 4. Remember the, the, the main image that Jesus uses, figure of speech, is he says, I will give you living water. Now, you and I in our very Lutheran mind could say, aha, uh -huh, he does, right? Baptism, and that's fine. That passage doesn't establish what baptism is, though, because he says you can, you'll drink it and you'll never thirst again. So I, I ask you, do we have a sacrament where you drink water that gives you eternal life? No. Okay, so, so really, literally, strictly speaking, that is a figure of speech. What is he saying? If you receive me, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. So the argument goes in John 6 when he says, if you eat me, if you drink me, you'll have eternal life. It's, it's a figure of speech. He's saying, receive me. The, I, I have come to you in my flesh and blood. I've been born as a man of Mary. I give my life on the cross. And he does. You know, he gives his body and blood in the sacrament. But he, he has entered into our human life so that in receiving him, by faith, we have eternal life. That's how that argument goes. You can compare it then to the next one. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And then he kind of explicates what that means. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, if anyone receives me, he will live forever. And that makes a lot more sense when you're reading that in terms of talking about faith. Whoever believes in me has eternal life. Whoever eats my flesh has eternal life. You see that? See the parallel? He's talking about faith. That's how the argument goes. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay? It's the Jesus who's come into our flesh. We receive him by faith. This is how we're saved and have eternal life. Okay. Any questions about that? Or comments? Um, and you can, you can read some of the other things that I've given you, but uh, Jesus in John 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he uses that type, uh, he uses the analogy of the serpent on the pole. Remember the children of Israel? They were being snake bit. And so God told Moses, make the bronze serpent put on a pole. It says, whoever looks on him, on it, will live. And that's where Jesus says, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes, whoever looks on him, right, there's the image, whoever looks on him will have eternal life. Jesus does this all of the time throughout the gospel. When he talks about how he's the light of the world, and he says, whoever follows me, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the same kind of figure of speech. Does he mean you walk, you walk a certain path with your feet and that will give you eternal life? That's not what he's saying. You know, he's saying that he's talking about faith in him. That's how you, you follow the light, is by believing in him. All right. So... Does anybody want to take a breather? You want to stretch? You want to think for a minute? Okay. The thing that we can't get around is that if John 6 is Jesus, you know, if he's using a figure of speech, as we said, that doesn't, that doesn't detract from what he know, we know and what Jesus tells us about the Lord's Supper. But if that's what John 6 is, you do have to deal with the fact that he's talking about eating. Um, and actually, this is addressed in our Lutheran confessions. Um, and this is from the formula of Concord. So you remember we did our study last year on the Augsburg Confession. So the formula of Concord is another one of our confessional 
documents that we subscribe to as Lutherans. I've given you a, a big, long quote. The purpose of this quote is to distinguish between what the Lutheran confessions call different kinds of eating. And I think this is helpful to this point. So, and this is solid. Now, you can still read John 6 and believe it's Eucharistic. That's not being disputed here. But just look at the, the point that they're making. So, the, the authors of the Formula of Concord say, there is a twofold eating of Christ's flesh. One is spiritual, which Christ describes especially in John 6, 54. So that's, you know, whoever eats my flesh and so on. This eating happens in no other way than with the spirit and faith in preaching and meditation on the gospel, as well as in the Lord's Supper. Okay, so that is, in other words, that spiritual eating of Jesus, that's what gives you eternal life. That's receiving Jesus by faith. So in a way, you, when you receive Jesus by faith, you, you're feeding on him when you hear the word of God preached. Definitely when you receive the Lord's Supper in faith. Um, but uh, any of those ways, that's how we receive Jesus spiritually, by faith. By itself, this is useful and helpful and necessary for all Christians at all times for salvation. Right? Because he said, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. So, receiving him by faith. That is necessary for all Christians. Without this spiritual participation, the sacramental or oral eating in the supper is not only not helpful, but is even harmful and damning. This spiritual eating is nothing other than faith. Okay, so he's already introduced the, the other kind of eating he calls sacramental or oral. Oral meaning with the mouth. Okay, so the only way to benefit from eating Christ with the mouth, i.e. eating him in the Lord's Supper, is having received him by faith, because that's how we receive the benefits of the Lord's Supper. So, spiritual eating is nothing other than faith. That means to hear God's word, in which Christ, true God and man, is presented to us together with all benefits that he has purchased for us by his flesh, given into death for us, and by his blood shed for us, namely God's grace, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, and eternal life. It means to receive it with faith and keep it for ourselves. It means that in all troubles and temptations we firmly rely with sure confidence and trust and abide, that's a Jesus word, in this consolation. We have a gracious God and eternal salvation because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's spiritually eating Jesus. And, okay, well, I'll stop right there. So 63, if you have anything, just say something. The other eating of Christ's body is oral or sacramental. When Christ's true essential body and blood are orally received and partaken of in the Holy Supper by all, everybody, believer, non-believer, who eat and drink the consecrated bread and wine in the supper. This is done by the believing Oops. Did it cut my quote? I think it did. A certain pledge and assurance. Yeah, okay. Oh, never mind. I should just read. By the believing. Yeah, it's received by the believing as a certain pledge and assurance that their sins are surely forgiven and that Christ dwells in them and is at work in them. This supper is received by the unbelieving for their judgment and condemnation. Okay. So this is, uh, that, I think that's sound reasoning. It makes sense of John 6, the things that Jesus says. And it also guards us against something that I think even, even Lutherans need to be on their guard against, which is this idea that the sacraments just are like magic, and they just work on anybody. They could work on anybody. Uh, and our, the ground of our assurance is that we are baptized, that Jesus came, he baptized me, he gave me all his benefits. But that is not supposed to mean that I, I was baptized at one point in time, and that means that golden ticket, like you can get out of the hot dog, you know, the loon's going my golden ticket is punched. It doesn't matter what I believe, it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter what I say or how I live, I'm baptized, and that means when I die, I got a fireproof insurance, because the scripture says baptism saves you. 
the scripture says, like that. yeah, yeah, they're like, yeah, no, I'm good, right? I'm good, I'm good because I was baptized, and and it's always good. God doesn't go back on His word, and the question is, well, well who who in this arrangement walked away from whom? That's really the question. Um, but we do this sometimes, and we have these things that Jesus gave us, and people. Uh, they, they fool themselves or you or me, but they, what they're trying to do is what they do in other areas of life, and they're gaming a system, and they're like, oh, no, I, was, I went through all those hoops. Yep, that's right. I did baptized, good, confirmed, good, communed, good, and then I come back for weddings and funerals. I'm good. Jesus said baptism saves you, Okay. Uh, the rejection of baptism and what it gives does the opposite to you, you know. Uh, so we have to be on guard against that. And again, that's why one reason that we fence the altar, because uh, I, don't, I don't want anybody to be harmed by the wrong reception of the sacrament. I cannot... Only the Lord judges the faith in the heart. We don't judge people's faith. What we may judge is we judge their outward confession. If they join themselves to a church body that denies the words of Jesus, I'm going to say, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm saying this would not be for the benefit you want it to be if you receive the sacrament of this altar. See, So the sacraments, they're not magic. They don't just work because you did something. You know, you went through the ritual. Um, for the person who needs assurance, who knows that he's a sinner, who believes the word of Christ, then they are, they give you assurance because that's how God works in us. It's his work. You know, I look outside of myself and I hear, that's why we say, we say the words to each communicant. This is the true body of Christ. It's given for you. This is how you know that you're saved because he gave you his body. But to go up there irrespective of what you do or don't believe, um, and to have no intention of amendment of life, and to say you're all men to that, that can be a very dangerous thing. See? Um, I knew a guy in seminary. We were swapping stories about vicarage stuff. He was in Indiana. And uh, in their circuit, there was a pastor who had a really weird approach to closed communion and he said that this guy told them in a winkle this pastor he said you know I have these people I come they visit I explain what we believe and uh, sometimes I don't think I've dealt with this but sometimes you'll have people you tell and you try and be kind you're like it's what we believe thanks for understanding and then they're like I'm still going to come up and I'm going to receive the sacrament now of course that ain't happening for me but uh, this guy well I guess was fed up these people came up after he said, please don't. And I come up, and this guy, I'm not invited to this. So the pastor goes, receive this to your damnation. And he communed him. Now, <laughs> <laughs> my friend was telling this to me and to one of our professors. And his, the hair on his head literally stood up. And he said a word that I, I won't repeat in mixed company, but he said, that guy is a jerk, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So sometimes you get fed up with people, but uh, they still receive the sacrament. At the end of the day, there's, there's only so much the pastor, I guess, can do to actually examine you. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to examine yourself. I don't know. Anyway, but we want to avoid that. Okay. Yeah, not his best day. We want to avoid that. Like, this is why just let the pastor be a meanie or be a meanie to your non-Lutheran family and just be like, it's because he loves you. You know, he cares about you. I don't want you to receive the sacrament to your damnation. All right. I feel like we've belabored this point enough. Um, can we talk just briefly then, now that we have, we have all our prejudices against the Eucharistic reading, let's talk about in favor. Um, I think we've kind of hit on, between some of the things that, that we've heard from Sueta and John, we've hit on why, okay, um, it seems fair to say John 6 is not exclusively or only about the Lord's Supper. And we have many good reasons why that is. But as we said, it does kind of illuminate the Lord's Supper, like it throws a light on it. 
Now, it's true, as we said, uh, that uh, yes, in, in the narrative, in the story, the sacrament has not been instituted. Remember the guy who is in charge of the story is God. You know, he knows the future. He knows what he's preparing them for. And as I mentioned a couple of times, from our point of view, we can say all of that about the Lord's Supper, but you still can't read eating my flesh and drinking my blood and not associate it with the Lord's Supper. And that's not a problem. That would be intentional because the one who gave us the Lord's Supper is also the one who's using the figure of speech in John 6. So it doesn't establish what the Lord's Supper is, but as we said, it kind of illuminates it. I mean, it, it is true, as we said. Does Lord's Supper strengthen you for eternal life when you're going to be raised up on the last day? That is true. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. And then he attaches his body to bread and his blood to wine. And a lot of the times you'll notice, you have to pay attention, but when we sing some of our, um, our distribution hymns, the ones that are specifically about communion, a lot of times the imagery is drawn from John chapter 6. Um, and we'll sing in sometime in the summer, uh, O living bread from heaven. O living bread from heaven. That's from John 6. That's not the words of institution, strictly speaking, but I'm the living bread came down from heaven. How well you feed your guests. Uh, that's, that's a Lord's Supper hymn that's drawn from John 6. And so in that kind of way, like in a pious kind of way, that's, that's how John 6 helps us with the Lord's Supper. It just doesn't establish the doctrine, is the thing. Um, so you could say, I think, that John 6 anticipates the Lord's Supper uh, in the same way that we've, we've already heard. I mean, you hear about baptism throughout the gospel, even though chronologically speaking, Jesus doesn't institute Trinitarian baptism until after he's raised from the dead. But, and we've seen this in John, and I gave you the, from John 3, 5. Jesus says to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That is a baptism reference. But Christian baptism has not been given yet. So if you grant that, you can't really look at John 6 and say, he's got nothing to say about the Lord's Supper. That doesn't really... That does not comport. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you don't fully know what he's talking about till you get to the end of the story. But um, that's the same kind of thing. You know how, because uh, I always heard this passage growing up. So Christians who don't believe, you know, that baptism gives you forgiveness of sins. You know how they get around John 3, 5? It says you have to be born of water in the spirit. I grew up hearing that that was amniotic fluid. So, uh, which is bizarre, you know. Number one, St. John the Evangelist, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he is not a gynecologist. And, um, like, number one, Jesus is talking about new birth. He's not talking about old birth. So, but yeah, that's, I was told that refers to the waters of birth. So, which is a bizarre way of trying to get around something, you know, that's there. But this is what people do, just like Zwingli and Luther. Zwingli dances around the point to get away from the word is. So, anyway, don't let that trouble you. Uh, and then I guess the last point, I think this is the strongest point in favor of reading John 6 in reference to the Lord's Supper. And that is simply to say, um, this, and this is also very important for us to remember, is that faith, so what we've called, or what Jesus called, that spiritual eating of him, that is not mutually exclusive to the sacrament. So eating spiritually and eating sacramentally are not opposed to one another. In other words, you never want to play this game where, because it, it seems like it always happens. If we have a discussion about the benefits that baptism gives or the benefits that the Lord's Supper gives, invariably, and people don't intend this the way it comes across, but somebody is going to say, you, you can go through all this. What does baptism do? Gives you forgiveness of sins, gives you new birth, makes you a child of God, gives you eternal life, 
Guarantees are going to be raised on the last day. And, you, and we go through the scriptures and see how that's what the scripture teaches about baptism. And somebody is always going to say, yeah, but there are circumstances in which you can be saved without baptism. And that's true, but that, for that to be like our go-to every time we talk about baptism detracts from what baptism is. Why don't we just spend a little bit of time being thankful that we're baptized into Christ and that he gave us all of those things before we jump to, well, you can be saved without baptism. It's like, yeah, but that's not the point of any of the passages about baptism, okay? That's not the comforting thing about baptism. Otherwise, we might as well just delay it for whatever, you know? Um, that's not the point, and I'm afraid we do this sometimes. And we've talked ad nauseum before. People who, mo or their motives might be less purer than yours and mine, uh, they say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, right? Now, here's the thing. Per perhaps that's true, but that is an odd thing, isn't it? Like, to say that the place, like the gathering of Christians, where God is giving those means that give you and strengthen your faith to eternal life, your faith tells you that you don't want anything to do with that. That somehow the faith that you have, which I won't dispute, but the faith that you have is sufficient that it never needs to be strengthened, it never needs to be nurtured, you never need to hear God's word. You must be on a different class from every other Christian if your faith is that strong that you don't, you don't need to go to church to maintain the faith that you got. And you know where you got it? was in church. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was through a churchly act, you know, when you were baptized. That's bizarre. And that's not what faith actually says. You can believe and worship God in your way, but you'll never truly know. So mm -hmm. I'm going to worship God in, in his, his way. way. That's right. No, yes. No. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and, and that's the thing. Like, faith is much more than a notion, an idea, or like uh, just assent like to a proposition. Right? Faith is a living and an active thing. That, uh, I mean, it's just like, this is why it's so apt that that God gives us a meal to strengthen our faith. It's apt because in human bodily terms, without our meals, we don't live, okay? So uh, we're getting to that time of year where sometimes people disappear a little more frequently, and I, I don't come down on them or anything, but there's a lot of people who be like, Pastor, I, I bet you, I wanted to tell you, you know, I was... X, Y, and Z in this state, you know, doing whatever, because it's the summertime. I'm like, well, great, I'm, I'm glad. Hope you found a church where you went. Um, like, like, I can excuse, like, so I'm not going to say, like, oh, man, you missed two divine services in a row. Three is a mortal sin. You know, you, you're driven out the Holy Spirit. Um, I mean, I can't dogmatically say that, will, that would never happen to anybody. But, but my point is, Do, do people, do they want to play that game is my question. Okay, do, how long can one go? So I guess the question is, how long can one go without his food and water? And even if you live, the quality of your life will suck terribly. I mean, it'll be really, really bad. Like, you, you can, you can fast and starve within an inch of your life and you'll live, but I don't know. Um, I, how long do you, does a person want to play that game? That's my only, that's my question. Yeah, Judy. A friend of mine, and I'm still friends, and I, I love her mom dearly. About 40 years ago, she mentioned this to me, and it's always bothered me. And now that you're, she said, well, I go to church on Christmas and Easter, so I'm good for the year. I'm like, <laughs> Great. I had no reason, you know, I was like, but it, after 40 years, that, that those two, that, that statement always has bothered me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I heard one time, I read it somewhere, I think it was a pastor, uh, he, he said that um, the most dangerous thing about missing church is you actually realize you don't miss anything. 
Now that might sound like a rather impious thing to say, but what he meant was, he was like on vacation or something, he had to catch a flight, and so it just wasn't gonna work on that Sunday. So for a pastor, he had the most, the easiest, most luxurious Sunday. He got up a little late, ate the breakfast, read the New York Times, had time with the wife, got caught his plane in the you know early afternoon or whatever. He's like, it was so easy. And that's the thing that people forget. I hope, of course, I hope you have these habits within you where you don't feel right. You know, you get up in the morning, you're like, is this Sunday? This doesn't feel right that I, I can't or I'm not in church or whatever. Hopefully we all feel that way. But the thing is, the more you miss, the less you miss. And that's just true. And, and the great, if you can think of just like ordinary, ordinary life, or you can think about what happened in this world and in this country four years ago, there are people who have still not gone back to church because the more they miss, the less they miss. And it's such a tragedy. It really is. And they still haven't learned. So we pray for them. Um, and sometimes yeah. you can go to a church and it, just because you go to the, a church doesn't, it doesn't feel like the right church until you get to the right church. Because mm -hmm. you want to spiritually feed on yeah, I don't want to say anything yeah. bad about another church. Oh, well, if you don't, I will. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. When I, when I, I sent, before I became a member of St. Luke's, I was a member of that congregational church. And I, and I remember... The, this sounds horrible, but the only reason I go there towards the end of going there was basically I went there because my mom and dad went there, and I always felt like I wasn't learning what I wanted to learn, or it just never felt right, even as a young woman. You were not being fed. The only reason I stopped going was because my mom passed away, and I thought I need to find a church that feels spiritually right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my mother-in-law suggested that I try this church. I said, okay, and poof. It's like it, it was instantly felt comforted, mm -hmm. like it was right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you can go to church, but if it's not the right church, it That's right. really does no good. Because we, we want to be fed by God's word. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the standard, you know. So, anyway, thank you. yeah, oh, well, it's, it's all, the pleasure's all on this end of the table. Um, so, all right, let's, we've come to the end. So my, my point with this is, when I say faith and the sacrament are not mutually exclusive, what I mean is, uh, you can read the words of Jesus when he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up on the last day. Um, you don't have to assume that, okay, you can read that in a sacramental way and you can, the operating assumption can be that he's speaking to faithful Christians. So if you read it that way, then that's not, there's nothing objectionable about that. If you, if you are a Christian and he says to you, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I'll raise him up on the last day. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's the comfort of the sacrament. Because you receive Jesus' body and blood, trusting what he says, then that fits, that works. And you don't have to look at it and say, well, it can't be the sacrament because there's going to be some people who somewhere receive the sacrament and don't have faith, so it doesn't work if that makes any sense. That, that was what I was trying to say, but you, I got on one of my, you know, soapboxes. Um, okay, is there any concluding things you want to say or ask or put in? There's the Feast of the Booths. That we will do, we'll do that next time. We will start John 7. I just wanted to take this one little excursus because I think it's important, and it, it, it does, as I said, it kind of helps with reading and understanding the Gospel of John, I think. Because there's a lot of stuff in John that could be kind of like this. But yeah, next time we'll start chapter 7, talk about the Feast of Booths, and get back to the, to the action, as it were. All right? So, thanks for your attention, thanks for your comments and questions. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us uh, the living bread from heaven, Jesus our Lord. We pray that by your Spirit working through your word, that you would always strengthen that faith in us which receives Jesus, uh, trusting in him, uh, that as we eat him in his sacrament, we might receive him for our benefit, uh, for the forgiveness of our sins and life and salvation. We thank you for these great and wonderful promises. 
uh, for the, those your faithful servants uh, who convey these truths to us, to St. John, right, and under the inspiration of your spirit, for your servant Martin Luther, who defended the truth about the sacrament um, against those who are opposed to what you have to say. We pray that you would keep us always in this faith and in this confession, that we would rightly make use of your means of grace, uh, that as our faith is strengthened, we would always look upon your Son and live with him forever. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks so much.